yes, well, I don't need to say much more about the topic, but I think I'd like to begin with a story about Mark's heaven and hell. Some of you may have heard this story before, so forgive me. When Karl Marx dies, he is met by St. Peter at the gates of heaven. Name? Ask Peter. Marx. Karl Marx, replies the famous thinker. Hmm, says Peter to himself, why do I know that name? I am Karl Marx, says Marx, beaming, a founder of modern socialism and a driving force behind the communist ideal. I see, Peter says, I'll have to check with God. So Peter rushes off to confer with God, and God hears that the, hears, when God hears the name Marx, immediately a look of disgust spreads over his face. Marx, God says, he's nothing but a troublemaker. Tell him to go to hell. So Peter happily signs the papers and forms, and Karl Marx is banished to Satan's domain. Sometime later, a free trade agreement is forged between heaven and hell. The deal is hailed by all to be a great economic leap forward that will re revitalize both struggling economies. After all, hell has plenty of heat to spare, while heaven produces an excess of manna. But soon after the treaty, God realizes that heaven is no longer receiving any products from hell, so he sends Peter down to investigate. Well, asks Peter of Satan, what's the holdup? We have an agreement. Satan shrugs his shoulders, exasperated. It's that Marx fellow, he replies. Ever since he got down here, all we've had are strikes and labor demands and productivity has dropped to zero. So, Peter asks, what would you have us do? Take him back. Take Marx back to heaven and I guarantee productivity will skyrocket. So Peter agrees on God's behalf to accept Karl Marx back into heaven. Normality returns for a while. But sometime later, Satan realizes that hell has not received any orders from heaven. In fact, very little communication at all has leaked from up above. So concerned for the economic welfare of hell, he makes a trip to heaven. Peter, Peter, are you there, Satan demands. Yes, what is it, Peter answered. What's the holdup? What about the flow of trade? Oh, I'm sorry, Peter says. We have decided to adopt an isolationist stance. We are a self-governing commune that is now focused on the needs of the proletariat. It is our opinion that this free trade agreement benefits only the bourgeoisie. What? Satan is furious. I demand to speak to God. Comrade Peter raises an eyebrow. Who? <laughs> It seems as though neither heaven nor hell can escape Marx's criticism, but my interest is in between, on earth itself. What has Marxism got to do with religion? Well, my argument has four parts. I'll begin with a brief discussion of the materialist reality of religion. I want to get that issue uh, sort of sorted out and out of the way first. And then I move on to analyze what really is a religious revolutionary tradition with a focus on Christianity. This tradition reveals a profound ambivalence at the heart of a religion like Christianity, and that will be my focus. An ambivalence, an ambivalence that's revealed in Marx's well-known metaphor of religion as the opium of the people. I can't talk about Marx and religion without talking about opium at some point, so I will do so. And in light of all this, I then examine a continuing question. Can one be a member of a communist party and be religious at the same time? So I'll deal with those four uh, topics. But let's look at materialist reality and let me see what I can do with this. How does it work? Do I just click on it? There we go. For me, the most important item in this uh, overhead is, of course, no right turn. I always read these signs politically, traffic signs and so on. But first of all, let me just get a, a basic point uh, out of the way, uh, and that is that religion is not merely a spiritual, otherworldly reality, but also a very material reality. 
Now, I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but I want to spend a few moments on it. Religion always involves, in some ways, engagement with economics, the economic realities of operating a particular religious organisation and so on. It's enmeshment with the economic frameworks within which, uh, within which we operate and so on. This is very much germane to the way religion operates. Religions need institutions. Now, by institution, I, I use this in a broad sense. I don't mean institutions as we might imagine, such as a church or a mosque or a synagogue, but I also mean institutions in terms of negotiated relationships, institutions in terms of the way in which people uh, interact with one another in a religious movement or religious organisation. And religion involves very much material practices, now, this may be material practices which give rise to religion, but also the way in which religious texts, even if they are written without any particular group in mind, will have material consequences. Uh, a group of people will form around the texts that gather people together. You have interpreters, you have people who will try to understand or, or organise their lives in terms of these texts. And we don't have to look at the writings of, you know, the religions that we might know. Uh, good examples, uh, a good example, I think, is called The Church of All Worlds, which is based on the writings of L. Ron Hubbard, a uh, science fiction writer. This kind of thing happens again and again. You have material consequences following from the particular texts which happen. In light of this, well, actually, I'd like to make a point first. I, I'd like to understand religion in terms of uh, Althusser's ideological state apparatuses. Now, by ideological state apparatus, he talks about different things such as the media, the political organisation, but also religion. And by ideological state apparatus, he does not mean an organisation that puts forward the dominant ideological position, but rather that it is a site of struggle. It's a site of ideological struggle that takes place all the time. And anyone that knows a little bit about various religions and so on and organisations will realise that they are continuously sites of ideological struggle. And in this sense as well, uh, religion takes on a very material presence. So in light of that, I want to suggest a definition of theology, because this is a theology lecture definition of theology more specifically, uh, and I understand it as a, to, as a disciplinary intersection. It deals first of all with the nature of mythology, the central stories which, with which theology deals. It focuses on nature and the environment. This is the doctrine of creation. It's concerned very much with the human condition. Anthropology is originally a theological term. It focuses on the question, why is the world the way it is? Traditionally, this is known as the doctrine of, uh, of harmatology or the doctrine of sin. It concerns the problem of human suffering or theodicy, the nature of the human subject, which is normally done in terms of debates over the nature of Christ, how human beings might live together, or what's known as ecclesiology, and the nature of history and hopes for the future, or eschatology. Now, with that kind of definition of theology, you may have noticed that the question of belief, its presence or absence, is not necessarily central. It's one factor, but it's not necessarily central because theology, and I would also argue religion, incorporates those other factors that make it a very material reality. Uh, one other small issue, but perhaps we can talk about this in the question time. I don't want to spend a lot of time with it now. Uh, it's the issue of Marxism and eschatology. It was my last point in the definition. A very common point that is made is that Marxism is a kind of secularised Christian or Jewish eschatology. You know, you have your state, uh, human state of sin, which is alienation and oppression. You have your saviour figure, which is now a collective, which is the proletariat or the working class and the peasants. Uh, you have your moment of salvation, which is the revolution, and then you have your desire for a new heaven on earth, which is, of course, 
socialism or communism. That's a very common point that has been made that Marxism is a form of secularised uh, Christian or Jewish eschatology. Um, a couple of brief points on this. The first one is that if you look very carefully at the material, you see that it doesn't hold up in terms of that specific connection. But it works if you move into more a general position whereby any ideological formation or, if you like, political movement has those features about it. It's not peculiar to religion or to Marxism that they share this more general form. But I don't want to get into that question today. I'd rather talk about uh, a number of other things, and this will bring me to the second topic, which is the revolutionary religious tradition. And this is in light of the material, material reality of religion. Uh, and I'm going to focus more specifically on Christianity here. But I'll say something briefly about this image. Uh, it comes from an extraordinary um, museum, the Panorama Museum, uh, in the former East Germany, which was built for the 500th celebration of Thomas Münzer, the leader of the peasant revolution during the time of Luther. It was uh, Thomas Münzer, as a religious leader, was a hero of uh, the former East Germany or the German Democratic Republic. The artist, Werner Tübke, was commissioned and it took 15 years to do this, this amazing uh, panorama. Uh, and the whole museum is devoted to just this one painting. It depicts everything about the human condition, the seasons, history and so on, but its focus is the battle in Frankenhausen in 1525. You can see a little bit in this one, the forces of the princes and so on are charging on the peasants. Uh, and of course, the peasants end up getting slaughtered. But in this particular image, the battle is unresolved. And at the center of the battle stands the figure of Thomas Münzer. The standard is down but he is not yet killed and the army is not overrun. Münzer is one of the figures and probably one of the most well-known figures in what can be called the revolutionary religious tradition. But where does the identification of that tradition come from? It actually comes from Friedrich Engels. He was the first to identify this particular tradition, which goes from earliest Christianity and runs like a red thread through 2,000 years of European and then also international history. Uh, Engels' importance for Marxism has not always been appreciated, but over 40 years of his life, Engels came to develop this position that religion, a religion such as Christianity may foster revolutionary movements. So let me explore a little bit how Engels uh, constructs his position. He grew up as a devout if somewhat critical Christian. He was family was of reformed or Calvinist background. His mother was of Dutch background. who was deeply influenced by Calvinism. Um, but Engels may have been very devout and his early writings focus a lot on uh, the realities of uh, religious experience and especially the Bible. Um, but he was also extremely critical of the hypocrisy of people in his hometown of Elberfeld. He found them both deeply conservative in their religious commitment, but also in terms of their social and political identification. But they did not hesitate to exploit people when they could. At the same time, Engels was an energetic young man and quite brilliant, took a keen interest in the newest directions in philosophy and also in biblical criticism. And that challenged what he called his Wuppertal faith, pushing him to new horizons, new arguments, uh, and also uh, arguments with his close but pious friends, the brothers Wilhelm and Friedrich Graeber. Their arguments concerned the Bible, theology, and philosophy. But in the process, if you read through the letters between the Graeber brothers and Engels, you realize or you see that Engels is painfully and slowly losing his religious faith. Of course, he was to replace it with another. But at that time, he began to notice a curious ambivalence about Christianity. On the one hand, it can be extremely conservative 
opposed to new discoveries in science and philosophy, opposed to new political directions and supportive of the status quo. But at the same time, it could also challenge those very same powers in a revolutionary manner. Now, strangely enough, Engels actually noticed this in his minister in his church. It was Friedrich Wilhelm Krumacher, a great German name. Krumacher was probably one of the most famous preachers in Germany at the time, ended up being the chaplain at the imperial court in Potsdam. But Engels listened to many of Krumacher's sermons when he was uh, in church, and he began to notice something about Krumacher's sermons. Krumacher often, often spoke about the dangers of power and wealth and riches and exploitation, but he did it in very theological terms. He referred to his earlier days when he was a bit of a student radical, and Engels thought if Krumacher was more specific, he would actually be a little bit dangerous. The agents, always there was somebody from the, you know, the... Um, the imperial court was always present in the major churches just to make sure. If, if it had been more specific, Krumacher might have got in trouble. This was the first moment when Engels began to notice a, a strange ambivalence precisely through the very biblical and theological terms revolutionary possibilities arose. It grew over the years. So, on the one hand, you find it in Engels. On the one hand, he talks about religion needing to be overcome. It's reactionary, it's conservative, it's a source of mystification and deception. The struggle for communism is also the struggle against the evil effects of religion. But at the same time, Engels also argues for the revolutionary potential of Christianity. He starts noticing leaders such as Thomas Münzer. There's another image from one of the museums in East Germany that I visited. He mentions Thomas Münzer, but he also mentions Etienne Cabet and Wilhelm Weitling. Wilhelm Weitling was really the first international communist and founder of the uh, League of the Just, the forerunner of the First International, and wrote a, a book called The Gospel for Poor Sinners. Once he'd identified this revolutionary tradition, it became a key element of his later work. He made a study of Thomas Munzer, the first one to do so. This was followed by studies later on by Karl Kautsky and Ernst Bloch, leading to Munzer being a hero of East Germany, a pre-modern pre socialist hero. Uh, and he also started to see that the inspiration for the kinds of work that, that these people were doing actually came from the Bible. But this was really all a warming up until the final statement that Engels significantly, I think, made just before his death in 1895. He argued that the origins of Christianity were revolutionary, religiously and politically. And it was Engels who first made this argument. It was a challenge to his fellow socialists who were suspicious of religion and its reactionary tendencies, and it was a challenge to the churches, which were keen to emphasize the figure of a gentle Jesus and the otherworldly piety of the early Christians. Now, Engel's argument had three points. Early Christianity drew its followers from amongst the poor and exploited, the peasant slaves and unemployed urban poor. Second, early Christianity shared many of the features of the communist revolutionary movement in which Engels was involved, such as sects, struggles, lack of finance and false prophets. And at one point he says that if he'd had the chance to meet the Apostle Paul, he would have shaken Paul's hand and said, so it was with you too then, was it? And the third uh, point is that eventually Christianity took over the Roman Empire. Now the third point is a little problematic. Perhaps we can discuss it later. We can disagree with some elements of his argument, but my point is that he makes the argument at all. And he sums it up in a text written at the same time, which reads as follows. It is now almost to the year, 16 centuries since a dangerous party of overthrow was likewise active in the Roman Empire. It undermined religion and all the foundations of the state. 
It flatly denied that Caesar's will was a supreme law. It was without a fatherland, was international. It spread over the whole empire from Gaul to Asia and beyond the frontiers of the empire. It had long carried on seditious activities underground in secret. For a considerable time, however, it had felt strong enough to come out into the open. This party of overthrow was known, known by the name of Christians. Now, this argument for revolutionary potential of religion has been deeply influential. It influenced the work of subsequent Marxists and even becoming the policy of some socialist movements, but it also left a lasting impression among biblical critics and theologians who continue to debate these issues today. But did Marx know of Engels' argument and approve of it? Seems as though he did. Partly because they used to meet every afternoon and talk about everything. Marx would start in one corner with a cigar in hand and walk this way, and Engels would start in the other corner with a pipe in hand and walk this way. On the other hand, they usually had a beer as well, so they smoked and drank and talked for hours, and they'd crisscross like this and talk about everything. But Marx's works also indicate that he was aware of this argument. One example, he compares the persecution of the International Working Men's Association, or the First International, with the persecution of the early Christians by the Romans. And he comments, these earlier assaults had not saved Rome, and so also the assaults on the workers' movement would not save the capitalist system. Now, by this time, you may or may not object that religion like Christianity has often been complicit with too many empires, dictators, and aspiring despots to be revolutionary at all. Of course it has continues to be. But this reveals what I like to call the profound ambivalence of Christianity. At one at the same time, it can easily support oppressive power and foster movements that seek to overthrow such power. But is Marxism aware, apart from Engels' argument, elsewhere aware of this ambivalence? I would like to suggest that it is, and it can be found in the well-known metaphor of opium. Religion istas opium des volkes. Probably the most famous statement Marx has on religion. But the key is how we understand opium. Is it a drug that dulls the senses, making us feel good for a while, but ultimately making us an addict, crime, disease, etc.? Or is there something else to opium? As for Marx's own crucial text on that, he sees it as both a positive and a negative term. Three reasons for this. First of all, we need to understand the text where it appears, or the, the opium metaphor in its context. So Marx writes, and you've heard this before, I guess, religious suffering is at one and the same time the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The phrase, opium of the people, comes at the end of this text. To understand it, we need to consider the sentences that come before it. So Marx points out the religious suffering may be an expression of real suffering. Religion may be the sigh, heart and soul of a heartless and soulless world, but it is also a protest against that suffering. Religious suffering challenges real suffering. It questions suffering and asks why we are suffering. In other words, Marx allows a small positive role for religion. It's small, but it's there as protest. And obviously, his point is that religions offer a better alternative to our current life. Now, that alternative may be in heaven or in the future, but it's the act of imagining, imagining an alternative to the current life that is a criticism of this life. Now we can come to the word opium itself. Now, for Marx, opium was in fact very ambivalent. And in order to understand that ambivalence, we need to consider the context in the 19th century in Europe when Marx wrote. 
On the one hand, opium was regarded as a beneficial, useful and cheap medicine, especially for the poor who could not afford a doctor. It was also seen as a source for inspiring the imagination of artists. I'll go on here. Oh, yes. Imagination of artists and writers. But on the other hand, opium was at the same time and more so towards the end of the 19th century seen as a curse. Many began to see that opium did more harm than good, for it led to addiction, illness and early death. So as a result, opium was at the centre of debates and parliamentary inquiries in the United Kingdom, which had benefited so much from the opium trade. Opium was both praised and condemned. It was seen both as cheap medicine and a dangerous curse. And the paradox, of course, is that the wealth of the British Empire, which relied heavily on the opium trade, which was forced on China, created the conditions in which Marx could actually do his work. So the paradox runs even more deeply than that. But third, and perhaps my favourite point, it's worth noting that Marx himself regularly used opium. He took opium to deal with his liver illness, his skin problems, carbuncles, toothaches, eye pain, earaches, coughs, and so on. The result of overwork, lack of sleep, bad diet, chain smoking, and heavy drinking. So anybody who's considering or leading a life of that form, then opium is your answer. <laughs> uh, he also used to take creosote. I think it's used in paint these days, isn't it? And, and doses of arsenic, so maybe that's not a good... Uh... I also used to drink endless pots of coffee, that's right. Um, for example, Marx's wife Jenny wrote to Engels concerning one of Marx's bad toothaches. He said, Chally is one of his nicknames. Chally's head hurts him almost everywhere. Terrible toothache, pain in the ears, head, eyes, throat, and God knows what else. Neither opium pills nor creosote do any good. Surprise, surprise, the tooth has got to come out. And he jibs at the idea. Now, the point is, of course, Marx's personal use of opium influenced his use of the metaphor for describing religion. It helped stop pain, perhaps even assisted him recover from his illness, but it was ultimately not of much use in dealing with his deeper problems. So, in other words, Opium itself is a very ambivalent metaphor, and this is precisely why Marx uses it as a metaphor for religion. So like opium, religion may be a source of hope, cure an illness, sigh a better world, but it's also a result of a world that is not right, and it can even be a source of harm. It's not for nothing, then, that Lenin translated Marx's metaphor, opium of the people, and called religion a kind of spiritual booze. Now, if you know anything about the history of vodka in Russian history and society, then you perhaps appreciate the ambivalence of vodka and religion as a spiritual booze in that situation. I could talk more about Lenin and spiritual booze, but I won't, because I want to finish with a fourth topic, a final topic. I'll ask a final question. First of all, I'll ask you a question. As Robert was saying, you may have uh, given up your celebrations uh, today, but I want to ask who would like to join a communist party? Forget Che Guevara t-shirts. They don't cut the mustard anymore. Instead, maybe you should travel to North Korea or indeed join a communist party. This is where I can show my prop. This is a t-shirt from the Communist Party of Australia. But what if you're religious? Can you join the party? You would expect that the answer would be a resounding no. Is not Marxism a materialist philosophy and political movement with no time for the mystifying effects of religion or reactionary religious institutions? Now, in light of my earlier comments, obviously I've got a question about this, but I want to actually now visit a number of communist parties and international communist organisations to see what they actually did and do around this question. Let's begin with the first international. 
founded in 1864 from a diverse array of left-wing movements, Marx, especially in Engels, soon became its leaders and gave it a clearer communist direction. On the one side, the First International was accused by the reactionary right and indeed by former comrades of requiring atheism for its members. On the other side, the anarchists who were involved in the international wanted it to declare itself atheist, abolish cults and replace faith with science. But was this, this the position of the first international? While Marx asserted that he was an atheist, he made it quite clear that the international did not make atheism a prerequisite for membership. As he said, as if one could declare by royal decree the abolition of faith. And as for Engels, he repeatedly pointed out that anyone who suggests that the international wants to make atheism compulsory is simply guilty of a lie. So in other words, you could join the first international if you were a religious believer. Why did they take this position? The first reason was that they saw religion as a secondary phenomenon arising from alienated socioeconomic conditions. So any attack, direct attack on religion would divert the movement from its main task. Second, and this is a point that Marx makes on a number of times in Engels, and I'll quote here, atheism as the mere negation of and referring only to religion would itself be nothing without it and is thus itself another religion. And the third reason is that they would simply be copying the bourgeois anti-religious programs because the bourgeois revolutions targeted the church because the bourgeoisie wished to take control of so many items that the church had under its control before. So it's very much anti-clerical and anti-church. <coughs> and if the communist movement was going to uh, copy bourgeois anti-religious programs, then it would split the workers from the prime, prime task of overcoming socioeconomic oppression. What about the Second International, which ran from 1889 to 1916 with membership from communist parties around the world? They were even more explicit. The key program, what was called the Erfurt program from 1891, this was of the German Social Democratic Party, the biggest socialist movement, uh, party in the world at the time, which was adopted around the world by others. And the Erfurt program says quite clearly, religion is a private matter. It was a freedom of conscience clause on religion. A key question debated at the time was whether a priest or a minister could join the party. And the answer was a resounding yes. But if the minister found the party program conflicted with his own positions, then that was a matter for that person to resolve. Even the far left in Germany that became the Spartacus group held to this position. So Rosa Luxemburg writes uh, in her piece called Socialism and the Churches, the social democrats or the socialists, those of the whole world and of our own country regard conscience and personal opinion as being sacred. Everyone is free to hold whatever faith and whatever opinions will ensure their happiness. No one has the right to persecute or attack the particular religious opinion of others. A crucial reason for this, apart from the ones I was given before, it was that the rapidly growing parties at the time were attracting large numbers of workers and farmers who were religious. And they didn't want to turn people away if they were actually going to be working with the movement. I've got another one of these. You may have seen them before. What about Lenin and the Russian Bolsheviks? Perhaps they provide us with a clear example of demanding atheism from party members. Here too we will be disappointed. For Lenin took the position of the Airfoot program. Now, to be sure, Lenin argued for a, a radical separation of church and state and that the party must not leave religion alone in propagating its position so that religion is very much a public affair. 
but this did not lead Lennon to propose that party membership applications should include a question on religion and atheism. Even though a socialist may espouse a materialist worldview in which religion is but medieval mildew, wonderful phrase, even though the party may undertake a very public and unhindered program of education against the influence of the church, and even though one hoped that the historical materialist position would persuade all of its truth, the party still did not stipulate atheism as a prerequisite for membership. Even more, no one would be excluded from party membership if he or she held to religious belief. As Lennon puts it in his typically forceful style, organisations belonging to the party have never distinguished their members according to religion, never asked them about their religion, and never will. So far, we've had little luck in finding a communist party or organisation that requires atheism or banishes religious believers. So I want to consider two communist parties of today. The first one is the Cuban Communist Party. Initially, the party did ban religion for its members. But even then, many of the members professed atheism while actually maintaining religious observance at home. So finally, at the four, Fourth Congress of 1991, it decided to remove religious beliefs as an obstacle for anyone who sought to become a member. Indeed, the Central Committee's report to the Sixth Congress of 2011 noted that congruence between revolutionary doctrine and religious faith is rooted in the very foundations of the nation. And to back this up, a statement from none other than Fidel Castro was used I tell you that there are 10,000 times more coincidences of Christianity with communism than there might be with capitalism. And if Fidel said it, <laughs> it's becoming a little difficult to find a communist party that requires atheism of its members. At least until we come to the Chinese Communist Party. Here at last is a party that officially bans religious belief among those seeking to become members. Indeed, in the process of becoming a member, a candidate is asked whether he or she has professed any religious beliefs. Anyone found to have done so is called upon to rectify such beliefs. According to uh, one of the uh, professors at one of the party schools of the Communist Party of China Central Committee, Party members are banned from joining religions. Believing in communism and atheism is a basic requirement to become a party member. So at last we have a communist party that is explicitly atheist, banning aspiring members who might be otherwise. Yet there is a typical Chinese twist to this. One must be an atheist upon entry to the party, but should one become religious at a later point, then little is usually done, at least if one keeps such beliefs discreet and exercises them along officially recognised channels. This is where the practicality of the Chinese approach to these things comes in, and in fact the Chinese government regularly builds Christian churches, Buddhist temples and Muslim mosques on behalf of the worshippers. And one may occasionally find a party member at such establishments. Now, I have a final question for you. Where is this church? You can identify what type of church it is, probably. But where is this church? While you're guessing, I'll just wrap up. Now, I've. I've touched on only four points concerning the relations between Marxism and religion, the material rea reality of religion, the revolutionary religious tradition, the political ambivalence of religion like Christianity embodied in the metaphor of opium, and the question of communist party membership for a believer. There are many more topics that could be discussed. I could go on for three or four hours if you gave me the opportunity, but you haven't given me the opportunity. So at least you, I hope you've gained some sense of the rich and complex connections between them. Thank you.